Hello and welcome to the Day Health Strategies podcast, Unlocking Accountable Care, the healthcare podcast where we talk everything value-based care with the top experts in the field. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Unlocking Accountable Care. I am still Sarah Matusik, a senior consultant at Day Health Strategies, and I'm here with my colleague, Lizette Roman, who is a consultant here at Day Health Strategies. Yep, so today we have another great episode. Um, this time we're talking about community health. So if providers and health systems want to improve the health of their patients, right? Not just health care for their patients. Um, they need to think critically about the needs of their patients in the context of the realities of their life. Um, this is an important approach because providers need to implement programs that will meaningfully impact the health of their patients, right? They need to, um, to see outcomes here. And uh, they need to implement programs that are accessible to their patients. So in the process of understanding patient needs and designing programs, a provider organization really needs to think about how patients are interacting with their broader community, um, right? So we're talking about outside the clinic, outside the hospital, and what barriers patients face to accessing their services, and also what staff that they need um, and, and what staff they already have who can uh, do this job of fulfilling patients' needs um, while understanding their lives. Right. So I think that in thinking about how these health systems have to be thinking differently about their patients' needs, we might be able to use a patient example to, to better illustrate this concept. Um, and so let's use May, uh, who is a single young mother who immigrated from Cambodia. She has two children, ages five and eight, and they, uh, the family only speaks Khmer. Uh, her five-year-old has uncontrolled asthma, and her eight-year-old has behavioral issues in school. Um, May does not own her own car, um, and she doesn't have a lot of money for transportation, um, largely because she's working two lower-paying jobs. Um, she's, but she's active in the local Cambodian community. She's taking English classes at night. Um, so let's think about her barriers to care. So why wouldn't she go to a health center or any other place to get you know regular primary care? She doesn't speak the English language. She's got transportation issues. She doesn't have any time and she has very little money to use. Um, But she's acting in her community um, even though she isn't connected to her healthcare provider and she doesn't have time to visit that provider. So we need to start thinking about how to use the community involvement in a new way to impact her health. But, But what do you do? How do you do that? Right? So let's say it's a health center what can the health center do for May? Um, Well, they could send a Kumai-speaking provider to the local Cambodian church, right? You mentioned she's a churchgoer. Um, There at the church, they could set up some, you know, free health education, maybe do some screening. Um, They could also take that opportunity to talk to people about, you know, going into their provider for services. So, you know, May might meet that health center rep um, and they could help uh, help her to schedule appointments for her, for her kids. Um, May could tell the provider that you know she, she's having trouble even just getting to the health center and describe some of her, her other challenges. Um, and then with that information, the provider could connect her to you know, maybe a community health worker who, who also speaks Kumai, um, who can then help to set up the transportation that she needs to get to the practice, to get to the clinic, um, to get those services, um, while at the same time, you know, helping to explain to May, you know, what the provider organization can help her with, you know, above and beyond whatever that specific service is. And when, once she makes it to the practice, the clinicians can evaluate her, evaluate her children. Um, that's that's the the great the great moment that you can create if you um, you, you know make the clinic more accessible to her and to her family. Um, the practice could also you know connect her to a case management team, um, also with a Kumai speaking community health worker, maybe a social worker. Um, you know that social worker can do things like get her an air conditioner, you know, to help her her daughter's asthma. 
um, to help her communicate with the school, um, you know, to, to try to find solutions for her son's behavioral issues. Uh, they could also help her navigate, you know, not just the healthcare system, that's, that's obviously what we're talking about, but also other social services that she might be receiving or, or might be eligible for, like, like the WIC uh, program. I know those are you know, just a bunch of kind of scattershot examples, but I think that you know highlights the fact that you know even a health center, even a provider organization, um, can uh, make care more accessible if they focus on the reality of May's life. Right, and community health centers have actually been doing this type of work for years. Um, in the past, though, their challenge has been funding this type of work. Uh, many community health centers have to cobble funding together through grants, philanthropy, and revenue from services that are delivered to provide community-based care, to, to actually provide the staffing and the resources to send folks out into the community to do care rather than having them in the health center. And part of the problem with this type of patchwork funding is that it's really hard to sustain programs. So once grant funding runs out, for example, many of those programs will simply just end and the staff will have to be let go, which is a big challenge. Uh, however, with ACOs and other alternative payment models that are now becoming increasingly popular, there's really a more holistic and sustainable funding source often for these types of efforts. And this is a more powerful way to build programs that can create more long-term solutions to these types of issues. And in keeping with that concept, our guest today is Sheila Och, who is the Chief of Community Health and Policy at the Lowell Community Health Center here in Massachusetts. Um, we sit down with her to talk about how the health center in Lowell is actually creating programs to work with their local community, um, what they're doing to actually meet patients' real needs, um, and how they've been working and are continuing to work to develop a workforce that um, understands their patients' lives so that they can intervene in really meaningful ways. And as you will hear, the health center has been doing this work for years, but the ACO that they've most recently joined um, has now opened up new doors and created a more sustainable funding source for this type of work, and she's very excited about that. So let's get to the interview. Hi, Sheila. Thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey uh, to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been working at Lowell Community Health Center for 18 years. I have been part of, um, I would say, the public health field for about 20. Um, started my journey in the city of Lawrence, working at a, in a prevention and education unit, uh, doing HIV uh, prevention and education, which in the, with injection drug users as well as uh, sex workers, uh, doing all kinds of education on the street, at the center. People would come in, uh, be able to receive education and also get tested. Uh, I did that on a volunteer basis for about three years and then ended up coming here as part of a service learning opportunity through UMass Lowell. And I'm a UMass Lowell grad, um, and I've been here since, working on a variety of different roles, uh, but as a community health worker at my core by training as well as experience. Um, working with very diverse communities and uh, a variety of different programs, refugee immigrant health focused and have taken a very strong interest in the area of cultural competency as well as all things social determinants of health, um, which is the hot topic uh, nowadays. Great, thanks. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do now in your role as the Chief of Community Health and Policy at the Health Center? Yeah, so it's a fairly new role here at the Health Center. Um, it's kind of grown, I think, out of the commitment of Lowell Community Health Center of having community health very pronounced and prominent throughout the organization. Um, I've been in the role for about two years, and what I do in that role really is the design, implementation, and evaluation of community health programs across the organization. And although I don't directly supervise every single community health programs, because there's so many here in Lowell, um, I oversee and provide a lot of technical assistance as to what those programs should look like um, and how they should be designed with them being community-centered and patient-centered. Uh, in addition to that, we also provide a lot of workforce development for community health workers and medical interpreters. So they both go hand in hand, being that we're hiring from the community. We're also training community members on how to be public health workers. 
understanding that that is the key to success to many of our interventions here in Lowell. That's so great. Sounds like a really fun job. It is a fun job. Yeah. (laughs) I'd like it if you could talk a little bit more about the workforce development programs you mentioned, because we know that the Community Health Center has done a really amazing job of building the capacity of members of the community to support its mission. Yeah, absolutely. So we have our Community Health Education Center, uh, known as CHEC, it's short for Community Health Education Center here at the Health Center, where we offer two state and nationally recognized programs, certificate programs. One is our Comprehensive Outreach Education Certificate, which is an 80-hour certificate program for community health workers or outreach educators that prepares them with the skills necessary to um, to do their work in public health. So leadership skills, assessment techniques, cross-cultural communication techniques, motivational interviewing as examples. Um, But it also couples that with a variety of different health topics, uh, topics around women's health or mental health, substance use, domestic violence, um, and it goes on and on in terms of the topics that we offer. Uh, The other certificate program that we offer is our Bridging the Gap Medical Interpreter Training Program. We're a licensed agency via the Cross-Cultural Healthcare Program out of Seattle, Washington, and we offer that 40-hour program here um, twice a year. Both of them run almost like academic calendar, like a fall and a spring, mm-hmm. uh, and we offer them here for our medical interpreters uh, or bilingual, bilingual individuals who would like to become medical interpreters. Thanks. I'd like to talk more about the connection the Community Health Center has to the broader community. We know there's so much important work being done in the clinical setting, but could you provide some examples for our listeners of the programs that you run out of the health center that impact patients out in the community and that keep them healthy? Yeah, absolutely. So we have, the health center is funded via federal, state, local, private donations and the like. A lot of our community health programs are funded via a variety of sources. We also, as an organization, receive United Nations funding for our torture survivor treatment program. Um, So a lot of those um, uh, programs offer us the opportunity to be able to extend the care beyond the walls of the health center. So we do outreach and education at places of worship. We do outreach and education at salons, at barbershops. Uh, We do outreach and education at Lowell Adult Education Center, which is an adult education center for um, whether secondary education for somebody trying to get their um, GED, for example, um, English as a second language, um, as an example, people, English learners, um, and we go and do um, education there. Other components are we work very collaboratively with many community-based organizations in the Lowell region. But one of the components that we do is also community health screenings uh, in the community. So we recently had one just last week where we go and we offer uh, blood pressure, blood sugar screening. We do health benefits counseling. We do uh, substance use screenings. And we work with local pharmacies to be able to offer things like the flu shot. So at any given screening, we reach like 100 individuals, um, and we link them to services back into the health center. So there's a lot that happens outside, um, and now with everything that we're working on here at the health center, now we also have the ability not only to provide that level of outreach in community-based settings, but in patients' home. So we're starting to do more in terms of um, visiting the patient's home, doing education, and really assessing the conditions in which our patients live to try to help improve them in some way um, to the best of our ability and with the resources that do exist. So you mentioned community-based organizations. Can you give us a specific example of one or more community organizations that you have been working with um, in Lowell specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the organizations that we work with currently is Community Teamwork. They are the community action agency for our greater Lowell region, and we do a lot with them in terms of um, social service referrals and exchange. Um, That way they see a lot of our patients, but we also see a lot of their clients here. We share a very similar um, uh, community population. So, for example, one of the things that we do with them is they have their uh, WIC program here on site, and we're able to refer to their work program almost seamlessly, which is wonderful. It makes it easier for a lot of um, families to access that service and removes those barriers that we know exist for a lot of our patients around transportation, 
language because we're able to support that language, uh, their language spoken here. Um, so that's one example. Another example is, as I mentioned earlier, we do work with the Lowell Adult Education Center and we collaborate a lot with them bringing education and community screenings to their students. And what's great is they allow the students to come out of their classes to be able to access those that screening. Uh, you know, great. Which is great, because you figure a lot of the individuals who are taking classes do this in their off time. They're working, sometimes multiple jobs. They're coming in to learn English. They may not have the opportunity to speak with a nurse, to speak with health benefits counselor, to speak with a substance use counselor. but the teachers there allow them to step out of the class when we're there, access those services, and then immerse themselves right back um, into class. So another example, and like that, I think many more, uh, um, that if we had the time, I would love to to discuss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yes, yeah, probably, you probably know every organization in all of Lowell and have some sort of relationship with them. Um, so I'm going to ask you a little bit of a more higher level question, and that's, you know, from your perspective of community health over the last, it sounds like about 20 years, you have a really good perspective on this. What do patients really want and need out of the healthcare system? And has that changed over time, or has your opinion of it changed? Yeah, I think for patients, what patients want for the most part is a system that is responsive to their needs. Yeah. And, you know, and I feel like they want and they also need that because I feel we we are able to deliver that to an extent, right? Um, and perhaps sometimes we wish we could offer more and not just speaking on behalf of the health center, but what I have seen generally uh, with healthcare, sometimes there's limitations to what a health system can do. Um, so example is, and this has been a topic of conversation um, in our greater Lowell community around uh, coordination of services. Sometimes things like having a signed consent form, obviously, you know, because of federal laws or state laws, you're not able to share information about a patient, but wouldn't it be easier if we had like a universal consent form, for example, not my idea, it's been ideas out in the community that would be able to um, facilitate that level of discussion. So it's, it's systems that are responsive and are truly patient-centered so that the patient doesn't necessarily have to come back for yet another appointment to sign something else, to come speak with somebody else, to do, you know, all those touch points. That's like, how can we better coordinate that care? And that's one example of so many. Um, so I think, again, I think the health system is starting to respond to that mm -hmm. in many different ways. And I still think we have a lot of work to do in, 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 in other areas associated with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that what you just described is probably the best uh, example or description of like what patient-centered care kind of sounds or feels like um, compared to, you know, system-focused care. So I think what we've been doing for such a long time is what's best for the health system or the health center or, you know, the physician um, or whoever's seeing the, the patient. But getting people what they need when they need it and having like a single access point for that is like the basic definition of, you know, patient-centered care, mm -hmm. which is, I think, encouraging that we're seeing more of it. Mm -hmm. It's not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and ask you a couple questions about um, Lowell's involvement in the um, Medicaid, specifically Accountable Care Organization, which is brand spanking new. Um, so I know that we're just getting started here, but I'd love to hear your take on a couple things. So um, just for the listeners' awareness, the Lowell Community Health Center is a part of the Wellforce Care Plan Medicaid ACO, and um, that is in partnership with several different entities, including Tufts Medical Center and Fallon Healthcare. Um, so specifically um, from Lowell Community Health Center's perspective, how do you see the ACO program affecting the lives of the patients here um, at this health center? I think um, the ACO approach is having us really almost catapult in many ways what we were just talking about yeah. around care coordination. It's really, it's really having us think beyond just a visit, but the patient in a very holistic manner. And I use that word cautiously because it's been so overused, but truly like really thinking of the entire patient and what the patient needs. So it's allowing us and giving us freedom to do that home visit, to do the care coordination with the provider, to have the community health worker available, to have a nurse to go with a community health worker, to include community health workers in primary care in a way that we haven't been able yeah. 
to do so because it's been usually that type of work it's funded in pieces in many ways and then once funding sunsets that effort is no longer there whereas with the ACO there seems to be promise at least and hope that some of that gets roped into the overall strategy and approach as to as as we move along so as I see it, our patients will greatly benefit, or at least a portion of our patients will benefit because it's, it's, it's looking to doing that. Eventually, I think it will impact all of our patients because that best practice hopefully gets replicated throughout other systems in the health center and hopefully beyond. And yeah, and sort of a watch and see right now, right. but I agree with you. Um, so you mentioned you know the outside and the beyond. Um, has the ACO at all yet affected your partnership or relationship with those community-based organizations that we were talking about earlier? And um, if so, how? Absolutely. So uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot. Um, and and the reason why is a lot, there's all eyes on this, right, on, on, on what's happening here in Massachusetts, which is great. There's also a big emphasis on social determinants of health, a big emphasis on what conditions impact health beyond the biological aspects of our health and what a provider can or can't um, have influence on or fix, right? So a lot of agencies that do work with social determinants of health have been um, approaching us and really been at the table and present trying to brainstorm ways of, so how can we better coordinate our resources? And the second part to that is, and what should we be advocating for jointly um, for our community beyond, so say if we take the topic of housing, which is a big topic, it's almost like saying healthcare, <laughs> 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 right? <true. laughs> um, it's, it's thinking about, so what do we need for Greater Lowell? How can we together advocate for something that makes sense for our community? Because there's, yes, there's existing resources that we can do a better job perhaps in coordinating around and with, but we know that the demand is greater than what exists. So it's, it's taking the conversation now to a whole different level and almost like enhancing the partnerships that have existed because we're all on the same Kind of want the same wave, thing. Yeah, yeah, we're all on the same wavelength and really understanding each other's roles and how we can leverage each other's strengths, but how can we help each other as well. Yeah. Uh, so That's a great example. Um, exciting, finally. Oh, quite. Yeah, very <laughs> exciting, yeah. Um, Okay, so the MassHealth ACO program switched the majority of MassHealth um, patients into one of, I think, 17 ACOs. Maybe there's more. Um, what do you think this means to patients, or have you heard? Um, and do you think that the patients understood what an, understand what an ACO is, um, and should they even, should they care? <laughs> yeah, those are great questions, and I feel like that's the question that we've been trying to answer since the ACOs launched <laughs> and even before. Um, so I'm not entirely sure all patients understand what the ACO is. I do think that for a lot of patients, they just know that my plan name changed, but maybe don't understand what, you know, what it means to them. For a lot of our patients, what we have seen is that they confuse Medicaid with options via the health connector, via private insurance, you know, either whether it's private insurance or even health safety net, mm -hmm. all they know is that they're receiving care. Uh, so we've had to do a lot of education on what WellForce Care Plan is all about and what is not, because it's both ways, um, so that they're on the lookout for different things. Um, for the most part, once they understand it, they're like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, that makes sense, you know. Um, and then there's some patients who are like, well, what about X, Y, and C? Because as an ACO, of course, you're, you're now part of a network, if yep. you would. You know what I mean? So it's both sides of the coin a little bit. Um, so I, I do think, you know, for our patients, it's important for them to understand what's happening. So I think there's value in absolutely informing patients as much as possible as to what this is. Um, it's, it's just a little confusing because it's even – even for us who understand what Medicaid is, sometimes it's confusing to even explain. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's helping people through that process. So let's talk about what is health insurance, 
Let's talk about the different types of health insurance. And now within the different types, let's talk to you about what an ACO is. So it's almost like layer upon layer upon layer. Right. So I, I actually teach graduate level courses on health insurance. And even for my students, it's a real challenge for them to understand. It's super complicated. Um, for mass health members, what everyone's really trying to figure out is how much information do you tell them? Because in the end, do the patients really need to know the back end changes and how their providers are being paid or the new structures for coordinating their care? I mean, ultimately, they probably care more about the quality of the care and the services that they're, that, that they're receiving. Mm -hmm. um, um, so last question mm -hmm. is um, that uh, part of the goals of the ACO program is, as we said before, to support work that helps address those challenges with social determinants of health. So we, we talked a little bit about this with housing. Um, how do you feel thus far that the ACO is accomplishing this goal? Um, and what more could be done in how we deliver and pay for health care that would improve our ability to do that type of work? Big question. It is a big question, I think. And it's, it's, it's very early on in the process, I think, for ACOs to, to see. But I think what can be done... Um, is really looking at all the best practices that are taking place and what do we see early promise on and continue to nurture that, I think, for the healthcare system. There's sufficient evidence, I think, in many different areas of models that are being implemented throughout the state that I think, even prior to the ACO, that we know the return on those investments are almost double and triple, you know, to, to the healthcare system. Um, but I think it's just a matter of tracking that and really guarding against not falling into what we've always done, yeah. being very intentional and deliberate about the fact that this is a different approach uh, to what we're doing in some areas. And some is the approach we've been doing is just hasn't been funded as we would have wanted for many years, um, but being very intentional and deliberate and keeping that at the forefront of every single conversation, um, yeah. Yeah, and well, I'm, I said that was the last question, but then I have a follow-up <laughs> based on what you mm -hmm. just said. Um, so, how do we measure it? You know, if we're going to have to prove that there's a going concern for doing this work to address these types of needs, I, mean, I know there's an evidence base that you should do it, and the 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 money is well spent. But specific here, how do you plan to measure it and um, think about reporting on it so that you can make sure that it is you know that we continue to address it for years to come so that's um, that is a big question <laughs> that is a big question in, in many parts in terms of like for an answer you know because there's your traditional metrics that one would have to follow you know the, the good old ED visit number you know <laughs> like reduction of emergency room visits emergency department visits and yeah. things like that improvements and uh, particular health care metrics whether it's you know, HbA1c's or you know, asthma readings of sort and depression scores and the like. There's ways of doing that, but we also have to measure the social aspect of what's happening. I feel the social need component, particularly as we talk about social determinants of health, because we need to be able to link the two. So I would be curious. Wow, the moment someone was housed, how did that impact? It, you know, it's not the it, yeah, sure overall, but like, how do we start making that link in a clearer manner um, and and there's there's a lot of barriers to even measuring those things and making the correlation but I do think that at least within well force care plan we do have a lot of the right pieces in place to be able to do it so I think it's a combination of traditional metrics but also kind of thinking a little bit outside the box and saying and how do we make how do we get this dotted line to be a solid line and measure that. It's going to be really exciting to watch and see how the data that's being reported on can further strengthen the case for these types of programs. Yeah, and absolutely. Well, um, this thus concludes our interview, but um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to hear your perspective, and hopefully we'll have you back um, so that you can talk about how it's been going after a year or more. Great. Well, thank you for having me. It was really great to hear about what the Lowell Community Health Center is doing with their community health services and how the ACO is now um, helping them to bolster those offerings and those efforts. One thing that really caught my attention is their workforce development and their training work. 
it's super great to hear about how the health centers um, working to train community members to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate care inside the health center. Yep, and not only that, but they have that community health education center, right, where they're training community health workers all across northeastern Massachusetts. Yeah, and it it seems promising that the ACO is going to be connecting even more with these community-based organizations, but let's remember that not all organizations have been doing this for quite as long as Lowell's Community Health Center. They've been there for a very long time, and they have great relationships So for those organizations that may not have been doing this work for as long or are just getting started, I think that, you know, what we can take away from this interview and our advice would be to start now, start early developing these types of relationships outside of the organization with these community-based groups so that you can think about innovative ways to impact the health of your patient population in ways that you may not have been able to do before you had you know, the the type of funding for staff that aren't necessarily strictly fee-for-service. I agree. I I totally agree with that, Sarah. Um, And, you know, even though not everyone is starting in the same place, um, totally not a reason to to start now. Um, And so, you know, I I think with that, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us for another episode. If you are interested in learning more about accountable care or how organizations can succeed in today's healthcare system, please visit our website, www.dayhealthstrategies.com. Check out our blog, follow us on Twitter, and join our mailing list. We regularly post content relevant to current healthcare issues and overcoming challenges in delivering value-based care.